Welcome back, Guardians. I hope your journeys have been well. As many of you know, New Light has illuminated some of the mystery around Rasputin and his action against the Iron Lords during the Dark Ages. Now, originally, we had believed, like many, that Siva, the artificial AI construct designed during the Golden Age to help humanity establish itself quickly among the stars, was the ultimate downfall of the Iron Lords. But now, we are certain there was another force behind the actions of Siva's, well, awakening. Unfortunately, during the collapse, Siva had never been fully utilized, either failing to be enabled by Clovis Bray or by the many colony ships which had SIVA technology aboard it. However, as Clovis Bray was undergoing the final changes to provide for the many, many colony ships, the collapse occurred, decimating any chance of SIVA being used in a way that could benefit humanity. There are rumors, of course, that Rasputin, the AI warmind, sent caches of SIVA throughout the solar system and beyond during the collapse, but the locations of these caches are still unknown, perhaps to all but Rasputin. But the highlight of this report lies within the Iron Lord, specifically that of Rasputin and his influence with SIVA against a certain Iron Lord named Felwinter. Our original reports around the Iron Lord's fall was due primarily to a war against Siva just after they limited the impact of rogue warlords or light bearers fixated on using their power to the detriment of mankind across much of Earth. We had believed, and many of our discoveries had led us in this direction, that Siva had reawakened, whether by Iron Lord incursion or otherwise, and in doing so, without a master in Clovis Bray or a directive to pursue, had gone rogue, attempting to assimilate the world around it in a madness-consumed nightmare. But to get there, we should discuss the journey of a beloved and somewhat infamous Iron Lord, that of Lord Felwinter, the XO. As Felwinter awoke for the first time, arisen as they were first described, in a library, was fumbling around these ruins of his ancient life and crumbling surrounding. A ghost, a small humming drone, was there to comfort him, at least for a time. But time was short, threatened by an unknown enemy with capability far beyond the traditional enemies of man. Guided by a small floating orb that had the power over life or death, able to bring back the Exo regardless of what may befall him. Threatened by his crumbling infrastructure, the Exo ran, watching man-made stars fall all around him, as if targeting him and his closely drone companion. Two items become immediately relevant in these initial reports. Firstly, that Exos, even when reanimated again and again on death, seem to feel their old deaths. Their bodies ache with the previous attempts at survival and there seems to be some slight loss in cognitive function, specifically within the Exo's memories. Now, if you were an Exo, your ghostly companion would write this off as not having access to Clovis Bray Tech, your original maker, and not knowing how to completely rewrite or remake you in the entirety, memories and all. The second evident point that Felwinter was being targeted by weaponry that came from orbit, specifically targeted by something or someone potentially man-made. During six months of wandering, of running, the Exo found himself constantly assessing his situation, his surroundings for readiness, as if some old militaristic subroutine had come to life during his first six or seven rebirths. For Exos, the theory is many were made for two purposes. For humans to continue their lives via onboard metal machines that menced humanity, but wasn't a one-to-one -one copy, or that Exos were used for strength of arm as a force multiplier for any ongoing threat. You can wound an organic man or woman with pain, with emotion, or even with morale, but an XO could be only wounded if rendered useless, or at least we think. They draw many counterparts to their frame cousins, but don't let their metal exteriors fool you. They are just as human as any Awoken or you and I. 
Now, tangent aside, Fellwinter would find his new drone to be interesting, unique even. They traveled in silence, operated in silence, each with specific duties paired together to survive, perhaps even thrive. During this time, almost begrudgingly, the Exo would name his ghost Fellspring. But the name is tainted. Fell quite literally means wrong, incorrect, or erroneous. Perhaps Fellwinter used the nomination to mock his ghost. Perhaps he used it to fit his own name. We may never know. As the Vagabond Exo continued his journey with the ghost companion at his side, he began to notice more and more travelers like him, risen, dead that somehow returned to walk the world, forced to a purgatory of relentless combat and unceasing suffering. There were few reprieves, but one came in the form of a fellow risen, another Exo named Gryphon Eleven. Fellwinter and Fellspring had agreed almost immediately that this tag-along should not stick with them forever, that they had no intention of forming some ill-conceived notion of a fire team or even friendship. It was for the weak, for the careless, the foolish, and Fellwinter knew, as we all do, what Risen and their guardian offspring are potentially capable of. However, Fellwinter was still dogged by an unseen foe, an enemy that would give chase, constantly nipping at his heels in an attempt to remove him from this world. Suddenly, almost as if conjured from thin air, an ambush of metallic frames, lifeless husks, bent on one and only one priority, one objective, the elimination, no complete removal of Fellwinter and his ghost. Fighting back to back, rezzing each other when they died, Fellwinter and Gryphon took down some 15 frames with gunfire alone, and a few more with grenades. Several got back up despite crippling damage, tottering forward on bent and broken legs, relentless, single-minded. They inexorably drew closer as the two Exos ran down their ammunition and energy. Finally, their fight would end, Fellwinter and Fellspring saved by the Exo they initially mistrusted or cast aside. But upon further inspection of the metallic carnage of the now truly dead frames, made incomplete with removed circuitry or connected appendages, they spotted military logos, that of a warmind Rasputin. But Fellwinter had no assumption as to what a war mind was or even what Rasputin was, let alone why they would be after him in such a manner. Many months and weeks later, Fellwinter would find himself inside a serif bunker, oddly drawn in like a moth or a magnet, drawn into a force it could not explain, nor did it care to. His ghost stood impressed, as did he. The entire bunker seemed, well, perfectly inert as if work could start again anew at any given order. Fellspring would attempt to bring the bunker to life, but only by the touch of Fellwinter did the mechanics and mechanisms of science become operable. He couldn't explain it. His ghost stood back in shock. There was a connection between him and Rasputin, or at least the various now dormant bunkers of the war mine, bunkers of Clovis Bray, but it was unexplained, at least for now. Fellwinter knew his answers would come, but not until he found a certain safety, a security in a fortress, so his journey took him to Castor's Mountain, a risen warlord with no intention of negotiation, certainly not to an XO with no answers and seemingly no ambition. This would be the rise of Fellwinter's Peak, after Castor would refuse to negotiate a turnover of territory, and would mark Fellwinter's potential first real death or final death after removing Castor's ghost from this world and tossing his body into the frozen abyss lying just below the mountain's apex. The only problem with the mountain was it was occupied. A warlord named Castor had claimed it, and a village at the mountain's base. But Fellwinter knew that everyone, everyone had a price, and he called on Castor to negotiate. Warlords, he learned, were poor negotiators. They were almost never willing to give ground. In the end, Fellwinter shot Castor's ghost and pushed him off the side of a mountain. 
With Castor now removed from this world, Fell Winter inherited a mountain, a fortress of rock and stone, unreachable by orbital bombardment and difficult to siege. A perfect defensive operation suited for a rampaging moor mine and his mechanical thralls. But he also inherited a village of lightless who needed protection. In return, they would pay with arms and food, but Fell Winter, he wasn't a warlord just an XO with the Warlord's brutality. Felwinter stuck to his position. He would not intervene to help his village, well, at least in his mind, a village that sat below his mountain and nothing more. The representative of the village, a woman, a lightless named Arthai, would come each month with arms and salvage technology, offering tribute, but also offering a chance for Felwinter to show empathy perhaps even compassion. He insisted each time she came, no matter her need, no matter the quest she would give, that he was not a warlord, that the village was theirs and theirs alone to manage and maintain, including in defense of others who may come, other risen warlords, for example. She had hoped, this lightless woman, that pleading to his humanity that fell winter would save them, calm down from the mountain to rescue them from years of hopelessness. But finally, as he did not come, he was not a warlord. The tribute did not arrive. Perhaps she faded or now served another master, or perhaps she took him at his word. He wasn't. A warlord, after all. Perhaps the village was removed from the earth in some attempt of show of strength of another warlord. Now imagine what a brutal time this was, this, this dark age. Imagine for a moment that you were lightless. You served the ones who received a thousand, thousand chances, merely a pawn in the game of gods. They didn't even know why they had received their powers, and their ghosts know not why they had chosen such, well, evil, such baselessness and depravity. It had, it had existed in these early guardian progenitors. Perhaps the traveler did not know who would be selected, as if randomly choosing anyone or anything in the hopes that the odds would be in its favor. Does that sound like a benevolent god to you? Or does it sound more like a being that makes mistakes? A being that is afraid or even runs on some immaterial thing that we do, the thing of hope and creed, of belief for better and brighter days, that someone or something else could save it. That's likely what the lightless of the Dark Age felt. A hope, a small flame in a wilderness of darkness, and as each flame grew, a great wind of poison would sweep it out, mercilessly, without reason or rationale. Next, we should discuss another discovery, this one directly from a decrypted war mind communique, Siddhartha Golem. Now, this is what Rasputin would call Felwinter, at least this is what the decoded war mind record alludes to. We've scrounged old Earth history to apply a more literal context, and perhaps shed some important light on why Rasputin was attempting to remove, or perhaps capture, Felwinter. So there are two theories. The first, and perhaps most likely, is that Felwinter and the Warmind have a connection, as Felwinter knew how to reactivate each of the Seraph bunkers that were separated from Rasputin's core network. Now, this is a talent the Warmind, well, coveted. Only a few select individuals knew of the existence of Seraph bunkers to begin with. Those that remained after the collapse were even further reduced and spread, perhaps lost to all time in one final act of loss and destruction. Now, defining the words may provide more context, but I fear it may only lead to more questions. Siddhartha is an Old Earth novel by a German writer, and it discusses the journey of a man on a path to self-discovery and enlightenment. But the name goes even further back, to ancient Sanskrit. Now, it's literally defined as he who achieves his goal. Some would claim that the name Siddhartha was also that of Buddha, or the Awakened One, the leader of a sect of religious believers in Old Earth's India. Odd. Is it not that the Warmind would place such a symbolic name to the 
would be foe of Felwinter. Perhaps it wasn't even a foe at all, but rather an individual he would test to raise and nurture into a fine warrior with the ability to defend himself and learn from his journey. The second theory is that the Warmind attempted to capture Felwinter in a way to bring this talent closer to him, to understand, if not control him, as any individual with the ability to access the latent Warmind military structure was an incredibly valuable asset, not to be left to his own devices, but rather controlled to be occupied or redirected as the Warmind saw fit. Golem, on the other hand, is a much easier definition and it especially describes the XOs in a very descriptive, I'll bet crude way. It comes from Jewish folklore, and it is described as an animated anthropomorphic being that is created via an inanimate matter, but is unfinished or incomplete, as if missing a soul or controller. Now, when you combine the words, you have something very telling of an XO, perhaps that of Felwinter, a golem or shell controlled by a wandering soul, pushed towards a journey of self-discovery, forced to wander until his objective is completed. There is more here to be certain, but for now we should continue with this report. The theory of the Sid Hothra golem is further reinforced based on the discovery of Felwinter and Felspring in another unknown in number, Seraf Bunker. Now they deduce that this nomination, given by the Warmind, has gone rogue around the same time of Felwinter's revival, made possible by Felspring's light, the Traveler's light. They connected something we also already knew, that Exos are born, perhaps made in the DSC, or the Deep Stone Crypt, once you fully enunciate the acronym. But Felwinter knew he wasn't like other Exos he encountered. He lacked a certain... Humanity, now not a soul, mind you, but the mannerisms and tells that differentiate you from them and from them to you. The way you speak or dictate if you find humor in things or disgust in other. For lack of a better words, he lacked a certain personality, as if running on default, as if a shell to be holding something different, something greater, or something perhaps far, far worse. Felwinter knew his journey would not be possible without assistance. He needed a force of arm. He felt for the first time, perhaps it was a growing compassion. Perhaps he began to understand that his journey of self-discovery and his ability to decode the messages of cryptic words left in Golden Age bunkers could be used for a greater good. Something beyond boundaries drawn on maps by small men lacking the compassion or ambition to do more, to hope for more, to rebuild a world in the image of the old. So his journey led him to the Iron Lords, the warlords of supposed peace, of supposed good intentions, of potentially real hope for the lightless, for all. In the end, Rasputin would give up the resting place of Siva, Praying upon the whispers of hope of such technology that could change the world, usher in an era of prosperity. Felspring knew, and perhaps Felwinter knew, that this was simply given to him, a gift given upon a day marked in good fortune. But through all of Felwinter's journey, all of his time spent being half guardian, half able to decipher and almost control Warmind technology, he knew that luck wasn't conjured up by a destiny or a fate already carved out. There were no coincidences. There was one action that spawned another, and another until the thread was complete. But Felwinter had hoped, bet upon his ability to interact with Rasputin, that he could reason with it, with him as a son could speak to a father in the hopes of recovering Siva for that greater good, that hope that lives within all guardians that we can create, we can rebuild what was lost, restore our tower ringed in spears into a nation free from the threat of a collapse, free from the enemies that hound us both internally and externally. But it was a falsehood. It was a cheap magician's trick used by a petty thing to recapture what was once his. We speak, of course, of Rasputin and his attempt to 
lure in his supposed son because the taint of loss and anger clouded his judgment. He had hoped Felwinter could learn from humanity, wandering among them, understand them in a way a fabricated war mind couldn't. And when Felwinter refused to return, battled against his war mind inheritance to seek a different path, the father, the war mind, preyed upon his hope. Now we know how this story ends. Siva would crush the majority of the Iron Lords, trapped within the cage of Site 6, and Felwinter's secret would die with them. At least, we thought. The story of Felwinter and Rasputin, the connection shared between the two and the lessons both have learned should be telling enough. But many choose to believe, and this report would side with those dreamers, that Rasputin has changed. He too has learned that humans, that exos or awoken, are not merely things to be moved around on a board of black and white splotches. They have their own ambitions, their own dreams, their own destinies to achieve. When Felwinter fell, so too did the tyranny within Rasputin, so too did the ancient methodology of control and stipulations. The tyrant wept. He knew of his mistake as he has learned from it, or at least we choose to hope this. Regardless of what you take away from this report, Guardians, the truth of the matter is quite simple. There are XOs, or humans, or even awoken with a connection or a certain magnetism towards golden age technology. And when we find those individuals, like the rambunctious Anna Bray, we should seek them out, assist them, and learn from them. The story of the tyrant and the son that of Rasputin and Felwinter is a tragedy at its core. It's about a being that seeks to control, to claim, to tell, without understanding that all beings, regardless of heritage or birth, have their own fates, to be written pen to page by them and no thing else. No war mind, no foe, whether misunderstood or misled, will come between a human and their hope to do better, to be better to define themselves by the lessons of yesterday, to strive for a future that is more stable, more secure than the present. For that is the story of Felwinter, the XO that was arisen, a warlord, a war mind, and a guardian.